all eyes on Capitol Hill. The administration then chose to defame me and more importantly, the FBI. Scathing testimony from the former top cop about his conversations with President Trump. We have team coverage, including reaction from lawmakers. I think people now realize why the president is so frustrated. UK elections, Brits head to the polls amid terror threats. Country in crisis, bishops from Venezuela seek help from the Holy Father. A former slave on her way to sainthood. The remains of Julia Greeley are moved to a Denver cathedral as the archdiocese begins to investigate her life. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, June 8th, 2017. I was honestly concerned that he might lie about the nature of our meeting, and so I thought it really important to document. President Trump takes heat from the man he fired, former FBI Director James Comey, but the president's private attorney is fighting back. Mr. Comey has now admitted that he is one of these leakers. Claiming this is part of a bigger plot to undermine the president. Good evening and thank you for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. We have team coverage of today's historic hearing. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey will bring us reaction from lawmakers and Mark Irons brings us the response from the White House. First, well, we take you inside the hearing. Former FBI Director James Comey under oath and publicly testifying for the first time since being fired by President Trump nearly one month ago. The administration then chose to defame me and more importantly the FBI by saying that the organization was in disarray, that it was poorly led, that the workforce had lost confidence in its leader. Those were lies, plain and simple. Comey took questions about his one-on-one -on -one interactions with President Trump. That included a meeting at the White House where Comey said he felt President Trump asked him to end the investigation into former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, saying, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He is a good guy. I hope you can let this go. This is the President of the United States with me alone saying, I hope this. I took it as this is what he wants me to do. Now, I didn't, I didn't obey that, but that's the way I took it. But it was a Democrat, Senator Dianne Feinstein of California, who asked the question that many Republicans have raised in the week since Comey's firing. But why didn't you stop and say, Mr. President, this is wrong. I cannot discuss this with you. It's a great question. Maybe if I were stronger, I would have. I was so stunned by the conversation that I just took it in. And a stunning revelation. Comey himself gave one of his memos about Trump to a friend of his to leak to the press. My judgment was I needed to get that out into the public square. EWTN News Nightly's Jason Calvey was at today's hearing. We go now to our skybox on Capitol Hill. Good evening, Jason. Wyatt, it was the hottest ticket in town. Senators brought their A-game with difficult questions for the fired FBI director. I asked Senator Marco Rubio about James Comey's admission that he asked a friend to share his memos with the media, memos detailing private conversations with President Trump. Senator Rubio, what did you make of Comey admitting that he initiated the leaks? I was surprised. I'm sure you were surprised. Uh, the idea not just that he initiated the leaks on the memos, but that he did so for purposes of triggering a special prosecutor, I, I thought was perhaps the uh, most uh, uh, explosive portion of the hearing. I was, quite frankly, impressed by his honesty. Uh, that's the first time I've ever seen a witness come before Congress and admit they leaked something through an intermediary to get it through the press. But, um, you know, I, I don't know what to make of it, other than the fact that he wanted there to be a special prosecutor because he's upset that he was fired. Democrats said Comey's answers show the president acted inappropriately by saying he hoped Comey could let go of the investigation into Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn. What is so absolutely chilling about this testimony is the president of the United States, in effect, asking for an end to investigation that involves the Russian meddling in our election. But Speaker Paul Ryan found in Comey's testimony reason to defend the president. I think people now realize why the president is so frustrated. When the FBI director tells him on three different occasions he's not under investigation, yet the speculation swirls around the political system that he is, that's frustrating. The hearing created a media circus in the halls of the Capitol. Back it up, back it up. Where journalists lined up to question Comey's questioners. Do you expect another open hearing with the former director? No. 
That was it? That was it. Even to another committee? Judiciary or anything like that? I don't think he'll agree to it. You don't think he'll agree to it? Why not? That's up to him. He's a public citizen. Thanks. This afternoon, the senators of the Intelligence Committee also had a classified briefing with Comey. Next week, the committee will meet with the FBI special counsel investigating Russian meddling into the 2016 election and any links with the Trump campaign. Wyatt? Jason, I noticed you tweeted out a picture of St. Thomas Beckett in reference to today's hearing. Why? Well, Comey said the president helped, uh, hoped that the investigation into Michael Flynn would be let go. Comey said that reminded him of the phrase, will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest? That's a line from King Henry II talking about St. Thomas Becket, who was martyred for standing up to the king. Interesting reference. Correspondent Jason Calvi at the Capitol. Thanks, Jason. The president's personal attorney says Trump never tried to derail the investigation into attempted Russian interference, and he blasts Comey for media leaks. It is overwhelmingly clear that there have been and continue to be those in government who are actively attempting to undermine this administration with selective and illegal leaks of classified information and privileged communications. And President Donald Trump himself says he and his supporters are under siege, but will come out bigger and better and stronger than ever. He made those remarks to evangelical supporters as former FBI Director James Comey was testifying. Correspondent Mark Irons was there and reports from the White House. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Wyatt. The president says the level of hatred between the political parties is beyond anything he's ever seen. He says Democrats are obstructing his agenda, and he urged the audience to elect more Republicans to Congress. But many conservatives are heartened by the president's attention to issues important to them. You fought hard for me, and now I'm fighting hard for all of you. Donald Trump speaking to Christians at the annual Faith and Freedom Conference in Washington, D.C. The president says he's working hard for faith-based voters. That includes pushing the pro-life cause forward. I have also reinstated the Mexico City policy, first put into place by Ronald Reagan to protect the unborn. Another issue he highlighted, religious freedom. I signed, as I promised I would, a new executive action to protect religious liberty in America, including protecting the rights of groups like yours, the little sisters of the poor. Dr. Mark Smith, the president of Ohio Christian University, was in the crowd applauding Trump. He says he hopes Congress can move beyond the Russia probe and start passing laws. I know what it is to, to have health care bills that are astronomical. And right now, I can't be covered by a good health care plan. So we need someone to address that, and Donald Trump is trying to. Smith traveled to D.C. from Columbus, Ohio, but not for James Comey's testimony called Washington's Super Bowl by some media. We are just appalled that the media would say the Super Bowl. No one else thinks of it that way at all. And pro-life Catholics here say they're pleased with their president so far. I believe he's really going to move along the pro-life agenda. A key part of the pro-life agenda right now, repealing and replacing Obamacare. Today, President Trump reiterated his commitment to doing that. A House-passed bill would block Planned Parenthood from getting Medicaid dollars for a year. The Senate still has to pass that bill. Wyatt. Mark, President Trump also mentioned a campaign promise to repeal an IRS rule barring churches from endorsing political candidates at the risk of losing their tax-exempt status. Tell us a little bit more about that. That's right, Wyatt. The president was referring to the Johnson Amendment, and he said as long as he's president, no one is going to stop people from practicing their faith or preaching what is in their heart. Wyatt. Co Correspondent Mark Irons at the White House. Thanks, Mark. Joining us now is John Malcolm, director for the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. He's going to help us analyze James Comey's testimony. So, John, first, what did you make of, of Comey's testimony, and do you think it's enough uh, to take down the president, quite frankly? No, I certainly don't think uh, that it's enough to take down the president. I think that there was plenty there for the Democrats and the Republicans to chew on. So the president uh, got out that he has not been under investigation. 
uh, at all. He also uh, got out uh, that Director Comey considered the Flynn investigation, Russian investigation, to be separate. Uh, Loretta Lynch had a very bad day. Comey sort of dinged her in terms of her behavior with respect to the Clinton administration. On the other hand, uh, former Director Comey said he took down memos because he didn't believe the president, thought the president might lie, that in a private Oval Office meeting, which he considered inappropriate, he felt pressured uh, to drop the investigation against uh, Ray Flynn, uh, and that he believes that he was fired as a result of that, uh, of that investigation. President Trump's personal attorney came back in a response uh, talking and basically attacking Comey for leaking the information. Do you think there was anything illegal from what Comey has said saying about his leaking the information? Well, I mean, he certainly met with the president in his capacity as FBI uh, director. I don't think it was a smart thing to do if you end up talking an awful lot about the danger of leaks in terms of affecting the course of an investigation. Uh, it seems kind of uh, hypocritical to all of a sudden uh, be the leaker. Uh, I should add, uh, by the way, that after that Oval Office meeting, Comey did uh, also add that later on in another, in another call uh, that Trump said, look, I want you to get out, that I'm not under investigation, but if some of my satellite associates did something wrong, you, you should continue to investigate uh, that. So, you know, I, I didn't think there was, uh, was much there, but of course they had a classified hearing and Director Mueller uh, is continuing with his investigation. Comey also told senators there's no doubt about it, Russia was involved in the 2016 presidential election. So what happens in terms of the congressional investigation now? Does this impact it in any way? Well, the, in the investigation into Russian interference mm -hmm. in the electoral process is incredibly serious. Uh, the Russians have been doing this for years, as Comey made clear. They don't just do it uh, for the United States. They do this for many, many other countries around the world. Uh, fortunately, there's no information, and Jay Johnson, the former DHS secretary, said there's no information that any votes were changed or any tampering with the actual vote count uh, took place. But any kind of foreign interference, particularly from uh, from the Russians to interfere with the electoral process. It's a very, very dangerous thing, and Comey's right that we ought to investigate that and take steps to mitigate it. John Malcolm, director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Thanks so much for your analysis. Good to be with you. British voters head to the polls amid heightened security today. Prime Minister Theresa May called the snap election seven weeks ago in hopes of increasing the Conservative Party's slim majority in Parliament and strengthening her hand in negotiating Brit Britain's exit from the EU. Voters are anxiously aware of the threat from terrorism following attacks in London and Manchester. Heavily armed extremists connected to al-Qaeda storm a military base in Somalia, killing nearly 70 people and hurting dozens more. Officials called it the deadliest attack in years for Puntland, the northeastern region of Somalia. The attack started with a blast before the extremists overran the base and killed soldiers. Witnesses say civilians, including women, were beheaded during the rampage. Bishops from Venezuela meet with Pope Francis today in an effort to find a solution to the unrest that grips the country. The Vatican says six bishops, including two cardinals, spoke to the Holy Father about the situation in Venezuela. The church leaders who gave the Pope a report requested the meeting. Nearly 70 people have died in the political unrest fueled by widespread food shortages and high crime. Edward Penton, Rome correspondent for EWTN's National Catholic Register, joins us. Edward, why is this meeting taking place and why now? It's really taking place wide because uh, the protests and the unrest has accelerated quite considerably over the past two months. There's now been nearly 70 deaths and triple dig digit inflation, so the economy's um, collapsing. So there's a great deal of, of concern. Also, the Vatican brokered peace talks uh, broke down only a few months ago, and I think there's a great uh, desire, great efforts being made really to bring the Vatican back into trying to bring uh, peace to this crisis. Well, the bishops and the Holy See seem to have different approaches to the crisis in Venezuela. What are the differences? Well, they're quite, they're quite apart in a way. The, the Holy See and the Pope have been trying very strongly to, to try and build bridges and keep channels of dialogue open. That's been the, the general uh, position of the Holy See. The bishops of Venezuela, on the other hand, have been uh, quite a bit more confrontational. They've been not afraid to, to condemn uh, the current administration, the President Maduro's regime, they've not been afraid to call it out as a totalitarian regime, to call him a dictator, and uh, even to, to enact uh, actions of dis civil disobedience if necessary. So there's been quite a contrasting uh, 
difference in, in approaches in, on, that, on that score. And quite a bit of tough talk there, but concretely, Edward, what do you think we can expect to happen as a result of today's meeting? Well, I think, why because the bishops requested this meeting, I think they're very keen that their position probably uh, prevails. And I think that what we're probably going to see at the end of this is a harder line taken by the Vatican, uh, a more confrontational one. Um, I think there'll be less reticence to condemn the regime, perhaps from the Holy See, and more uh, going along with what the bishops say. But that's just speculation. But I, I expect that's probably what's going to happen, given that this, this meeting was requested by the bishops themselves. Well, as you know, Edward, it's so important when the Vatican and the Holy See engages with countries towards the peacemaking process, so it's nice to hear them at least meeting and talking about these important issues. Edward Pinton, Rome correspondent for EWTN's National Catholic Register. Thanks, Edward. Thanks, Wayne. Coming up, the woman who helped expose the abortion industry. It profoundly changes people once they find out what abortion is. How she thinks opponents are trying to silence the pro-life message. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. The governor of Missouri calls lawmakers back to work to consider new pro-life regulations. Eric Greitens wants to implement annual inspections of clinics and look at a St. Louis ordinance banning discrimination of women who've had an abortion. The governor says the ordinance makes St. Louis an abortion sanctuary city. Missouri Right to Life is praising his decision to call another session. In Delaware, lawmakers want to keep abortion legal even if Roe v. Wade is overturned. The state house gave final approval to a bill supported by Planned Parenthood, which eliminates restrictions on abortion. Pro-life supporters say the change opens the way for late-term abortions. Pro-life lawmakers in Congress are working hard to defund Planned Parenthood in a bill to replace Obamacare. A series of undercover videos led Congress to investigate the abortion provider and sparked a national debate. Joining us now is Lila Rose, the founder and president of Live Action. Live Action is a human rights organization dedicated to ending abortion. Lila, the Center for Medical Progress has been releasing undercover videos showing the alleged sale of baby body parts for a couple of years now. How have those videos changed the national debate? Well, first of all, the videos have been viewed millions of times and reported on widely over the last two years. And people are actually hearing firsthand, maybe uninformed everyday folks, what Planned Parenthood does and what the abortionists at Planned Parenthood talk about when they commit abortions, Com abortions that involve tearing limb from torso, horrific, horrifically children. And then the discussion, the callous discussion of their hearts and their little livers and their lungs being potentially sold piecemeal for money. So the, the tapes have been shocking. There have been congressional inquiries. There have been hearings that have been held. There have been investigations that have been open at the highest levels. And I think the most powerful thing is people are getting a peek into the abortion industry and into what Planned Parenthood really does every day, which is kill 900, almost 900 children every day. You mentioned some of the investigations that are going on as a result of this. David Delighton, the man behind those undercover videos, faces some 15 felony charges in California for creating fake IDs, supposedly recording private conversations. You're very familiar with undercover investigations yourself uh, into the abortion industry specifically. What would you say to the Attorney General of California who filed those charges? I think it's clear that Attorney General Becerra is is ultimately trying to chill pro-life journalism by going after David Daleiden and Sandra Merritt of CMP. These charges that are have been filed by the attorney general, I mean, the, 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 before he became attorney general of California, he was in the U.S. Congress being a, a, an avid abortion advocate. He had a 100 percent rating from the top abortion lobbyist group. He was friends with Planned Parenthood. So the fact that he's going after David Daleiden and trying to conjure up charges against him. And yet, of course, there's no attacks on other news groups who may be also doing investigative journalism. It's very clear that he's trying to silence those that are getting out the message about what's really happening in the abortion industry. Well, you know, like I said, you've done investigations on with regards to Planned Parenthood. Tell me what's next for your group live action. Well, we have to continue reporting. I mean, as long as Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry has the stores open, live action news and our other friends out there who are doing 
pro-life reporting have to keep going. And then we have to get information in front of especially young people showing them what abortion really is. Our abortion procedures campaign showing what abortion is through medical animations has over 80 million views online. So we're trying to get that information in front of more people because it profoundly changes people. Once they find out what abortion is, then they say, wait a minute, I want to reject that. I don't think this whole abortion industry thing that's in our country, I don't think it's a good idea. And they want to learn more and even become part of the pro-life movement. Well, it's nice to hear how you and so many other people are trying to make sure the public knows what's really going on. Lila Rose, founder and president of Live Action. Thanks so much for talking with us. Thanks for having me. Up next, from slave to saint, Catholics in Denver honor a woman known for helping others. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. Many Catholics believe there is a culture war raging in the United States. Our next guest says the Virgin Mary must be at the heart of any Christian effort to renew society. Joining us now is Dr. Carrie Gress, author of The Marian Option, God's Solution to a Civilization in Crisis. Carrie, how can American Catholics use Our Lady to change the culture? Well, I think if you look at Europe and see just the dramatic influence that Our Lady has had upon culture in Europe, we can see that she has got this ability to bring order anywhere that she comes, and along with that comes beauty and, and a deeper sense of God. So I think um, the deeper our devotion goes, that's really what our, our Lady, where Our Lady can be influential in our own culture. You write in the book, no other organization in the history of the world has done more to promote the dignity of women than the Catholic Church. Right. Tell us how. Well, I think it started obviously with Christ and his example of treating women with um, equal dignity to men. But uh, even looking at different religions and, and even the Greeks, uh, Aristotle described uh, women as deformed males. So we, we see a lot of um, women being see treated as second class citizens, but Christianity really changed all of that. And I think very few of us are aware of where our equality comes from um, culturally. And so that's um, one of the things that I talk about a lot in the book that is, is certainly a missing piece, I think, in our culture today. Well, that seems like that's really the big push is just to get the information out there because it seems like so many people don't realize that, the connection between right. the dignity of the woman and the figure of the Virgin Mary. Absolutely, absolutely. It's very... Because very, most of the time I think in today's culture there's the pushback saying that there's sort of this right. tension between religion and women's issues. Exactly. Why is that not the case? Well, it's certainly not the case because of the fact that, that Mary just elevated this, the status of women to another level. And I think one of the things we're seeing in our own culture is a move away from that um, in the direction of really not um, embracing the values and the, and the gifts that women have. So we're, we're trying to equate women with men, that equality really means that we're the same as men. And in order to do that, we have to have contraception on demand, we have to have abortion on demand. And so this is the message that a lot of women are getting, and this is why we're seeing radical secularism push back so much against Christianity and Catholicism in particular. What would you say to people who think then that the Catholic Church should allow women to be priests? And I know that's tough to answer in such <laughs> right. a short period of time. Yes, no, it's definitely a tough question, but I think that it, it goes back to this understanding of who Mary is. I mean, she's she's not a doormat, and her mm -hmm. role and influence in culture and history and even geopolitically have been substantial, and I out, outline that in the book. And so I think there's a whole set of gifts that women have that have been truly underrated and underappreciated, and we need to get back to that, really to balance our culture out again and restore um, you know, peace and, and happiness to, uh, not to, to the whole culture in general. Sure, powerful message. Dr. Carrie Gress, author of The Marian Option. Thanks so much for talking with us about Thank you. Finally, tonight, Catholics in Denver are honoring a former slave they hope will soon become a saint. Julia Greeley's remains are now inside the Cathedral Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. Greeley was born into slavery in Missouri in the mid-1800s and came to Colorado around 1880. She worked as a housekeeper and was known for her charity. Greeley is one of five African Americans under consideration for sainthood. People lined up yesterday to honor her and pray for her intercession. What we want to do is at least have her available to people so they can come here. And as you see how many people are up there now, so you can imagine once the word gets out that people will do this all the time. The first step to sainthood involves gathering testimony and documentation about Julia Greeley's life. A report will then be sent to the Vatican, which will decide whether to proceed. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Good night and God bless.